Yes, welcome into Sports Bit. Betty and Insight today, Paulie and Teddy, Wednesday, June 28th. Big game breakdown, just one game, and bad beats, bad bets, bad for the books. And we finish off the AFC North with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Their win total 10.5 here in Vegas, plus the play of the day. You wake up yesterday morning, a huge, huge upset. New Jersey gets in under the deadline. The Supreme Court grants fewer than 2% of petitions Daniel Wallach, gaming and sports law attorney. This was the number one obstacle for New Jersey. It's the first time they actually won something since 2012 where a decision went their way. This is the closest New Jersey's ever been to legalized sports betting. And if the leagues lose, the states will have control, Teddy. This is, this is a massive story. It's, it is. I mean, honestly, I've been in Las Vegas since 1998. And this is a day that nothing's happened yet. You know, the, the New Jersey didn't win anything yet. The only thing that's happened is the Supreme Court said they are going to hear the case. But we've never even been close to this point, in my opinion, until today. Kind of an exciting time to be a sports better anywhere in the USA. Because, I mean, remember, New Jersey signed legislation in 2012. Uh, Chris Christie did it again in 2014. And both times... We've seen, we saw the courts strike it down, and New Jersey didn't win anything for any of those. Now, it's a Supreme Court, and that means it's a whole different ballgame. The political composition is different, and the questions that the case is going to be decided on. There's a lot of technicalities to it, but you know what? We're live. We're live in the 50-50 range, which is something that's uh, truly remarkable, Paulie. It really is. It is the sports betting story uh, of uh, you know the the modern era. To me, it's a, it's a, a, should be more than that. It's a no brainer that it's unconstitutional and violates the Tenth Amendment. Uh, this pass was a joke. Dan Wetzel was. To, by the way, if the court sides with New Jersey, they will be open for business for the 2018 NFL season, and maybe it could take a year for the decision uh, with that one. Uh, the, the leagues have been quiet. Not, nothing, hold on, nothing from Major League Baseball and nothing from the NBA so far as David Purdom's been going back and forth on emails and he's heard nothing. But I thought Dan Wetzel was terrific. Uh, Yahoo Sports, in 1992, the pro sports leagues in the NC2A used fear-mongering to a socially conservative public to argue that legalization would lead to point-shaving scandals and match-fixing. Back then, casinos were almost exclusively in Las Vegas and Atlantic City, 25 years later, casinos are in 39 states. You can play Keno at 7-Eleven. 44 states have government-run lotteries. Pro sports franchises are involved with daily fantasy. Take money from cons- take money from casinos and scratch-off tickets as well. Poker's everywhere on TV. And our good friend David Stern, even in 2014, quote, times have changed. Time to monitor and regulate it. Bring it out of the underground. All of which is true. But again, here's a quote from Chris Christie, who just, you know, now the case is going to be heard. Quote, we're not declaring victory, but at least we're in the game, and that's where we want to be. And that's the truth of it. You know, why is this happening? How has the American populace come to accept sports betting in a way that, didn't, that they didn't accept it 25 years ago? Real simple, Polly. It's guys like me and you. It's guys like who are watching the guys who are watching the show right now. You know, eh, what's happened is sports betting has been normalized. It's not Oh, mob and uh, fear-mongering that you were talking about. It is, you you know, <laughs> everybody in the neighborhood. All the people under the age of 40 who are gambling, uh, in terms of the male demographic, heavily towards sports betting. It's regular Joes who want to do this and not do it in an illegal environment. And obviously, that sets the stage politically for what we're seeing. Okay, here's another quote from Jeff Freeman, the head of the AGA. You know, we are pleased the Supreme Court appears to have responded favorably to our arguments as to why they should hear this important case. And we are hopeful that their engagement will provide further encouragement for Congress to take the steps necessary to create regulated sports betting marketplace in the U.S. Let's not forget, Paul, you were talking about the thing that the case is going to be hinged on. And we're not going to get a decision on this case. This is what I was trying to cut you off on. We're not going to get a decision on this case until 2018. Sometime Uh, between January and June of 2018, we would expect to have a ruling on this case, but nothing in 2017. So Christie's dreaming if he thinks he's going to have the Super Bowl uh, live for betting in Atlantic City uh, this coming uh, January or February. But 
the key issue here, it has everything to do, as you mentioned, the Tenth Amendment, the anti-commandeering amendment, where there are, are uh, not, uh, I shouldn't say amendment, the anti-commandeering part of the Tenth Amendment, which basically says that bars Congress from ordering states to adapt a particular regulatory scheme when the federal government itself has not adapted a relevant scheme. Obviously, it's a technical legal point. So my opinion, your opinion, it's going to come down to the legal ease. But even if it fails, that's the beauty of this, even if it fails, New Jersey still has very much a nuclear option in their pocket. This whole legislation that's been passed and been going through the court system, it's all about working with the PASPA regulations. If we're talking about New Jersey losing the Supreme Court case, they can use, quote unquote, the nuclear option in which they say, hey, sports betting is legal and there are no regulations, in which case now it is not violating the federal law and it opens up a whole new bag of worms. Freeman said it's fueling an unregulated 150 billion illegal uh, gambling market that continues to deprive states of public funding for services such as law enforcement and infrastructure. It's probably closer to 500 billion. Uh, I think he's low with that. What does this do for Las Vegas if it's if it's uh, if they if the decision goes their way? And that's an interesting question because you're getting two sides to that argument. Some people think that one of the reasons that Las Vegas does so well for all the major events, you know, the March Madness, the uh, Super Bowl, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, is because of the fact that we're the only ones where you can have these huge parties. And if you start seeing other states that legalize sports betting, that all of a sudden Vegas doesn't become the same draw that it once was for the big events. That being said, I'm not buying that argument. I'm really not. Las Vegas has been the center of the sports betting universe, uh, certainly in the United States, for uh, the last 60, 70 years. I don't see that changing, even if other states legalize it and regulate it. They're still going to get their odds from Vegas. They're still going to be paying attention to where the Vegas money is. And I don't think Vegas becomes any less attractive of a destination for major events, uh, even if we see it in other states. Well, William Hill, they're just waiting. You know, they were doing cartwheels in the offices today, but uh, you see Monmouth Park, there, that picture, they're ready and open for business. They're just waiting for the go-ahead. Sure, and I got a great quote here from Dennis Drazen, who's from Monmouth Park. Uh, he's an attorney who's been uh, basically consulting for them on this case for years, and he's calling it 50-50 for 2018. But the point that Drazen is making, this is from Patrick Everson's great article at Covers.com. You talked about the Dan Wetzel piece. Gosh, there was a really good piece uh, from Michael McCann on SI.com uh, yesterday. So uh, some strong writing on the subject. Plenty uh, for those of you out there that want to do a little bit more research on this subject. But uh, the point that Drazen was making from Monmouth Park is basically, even if the Supreme Court does rule in favor of New Jersey, it's still going to be a situation where you don't know what part is going to be found acceptable, what part's not acceptable, and the legislatures, including Congress, may well have to come in and clean this mess up. All the folks who have been involved in the process are saying the Supreme Court case itself won't solve the problem. There will still need to be some kind of legislation, but if the Supreme Court rules in favor of New Jersey, at least there's a basis for that legislation. Obviously, if the leagues win uh, and New Jersey is, is betting, ban or betting is shut down long term, then the, none of those uh, situations are in play. None of those issues become in play. Hey, Trump, feel free to check in, will you? Atlantic City's dying. You're in the casino business. What the hell? I haven't heard a word from you. That's why the Supreme Court delayed their ruling for a while to see what you would say. Nothing. Who knows what you're doing? Yeah. Uh, but we, we got a great quote from Jimmy Vaccaro, and I love, uh, of course, over at the South Point here in Las Vegas. And Vaccaro, he's throwing a little cold water on this. You know, how much is left to give the leagues? Nothing, said Vaccaro. Say you have a guy walking up to the window and he bets hundred grand on Floyd Mayweather. Before anything else happens, you have a 0.25% tax where you pay whether Mayweather wins or loses. That's a federal tax. It costs us 250 bucks. If Mayweather wins, we pay out the winning ticket and it still costs another 250 bucks to take that winning wager on Mayweather. So what Vaccaro is saying is something that I've been talking about. If, if the leagues want to cut and the states want to cut, that's the end of minus 110. And we start talking about minus 115 and minus 120. And when you talk about that now, a three-team parlay, instead of being paying six to one, it pays less than five to one. And 
it gets really, really, really hard to win long term at sports betting and bookies probably stay in business. So uh, let's not forget that even if everything works out in everyone's favor, well, now there's a whole lot of people that are going to want their hands in the pie. All right. Very good. That was 10 minutes of the big story. A lot of fun. How about the football betting conference with SBR? What are you doing August 4th and 5th that's more important than going down to Costa Rica for the first inaugural International Football Betting Conference? I'm going to be there. I'm going to be joined by Matthew Holt from CG Technology. We're talking Gil Alexander from the VSIN Network and a host of other big names in the sports betting industry. August 4th and 5th in San Jose, Costa Rica. Sign up right now. Find out all the details. And get on the invite list, visit www.ifbc.live. Again, www.ifbc.live. Bad beats, bad bets, bad for the books, and big game breakdown up next. The Pittsburgh Steelers in the deep dive on Sportsbit. Betting insight today on sbrpicks.com. Go to sbrodds.com. Browse, compare, and shop live odds available at top online sportsbooks. Back on Sports Bit, betting inside today. Paulie Howard, Teddy Covers. Deep dive coming up. Bad beats, bad bets, bad for the books. Bad beat. Cub Nash, Cubs Nats. Total was seven and a half. It fell seven. It was sitting on seventh in the fifth inning, and it died, Teddy. <laughs> it died? You're not kidding. I mean, the Nats had their way with Jake Arrieta. We talked about him on yesterday's show and the struggles that he's been having. 12 of the 24 batters that he faced reached base, and Arrieta needed 98 pitches to get through four innings. And plus, the Nats burn him for seven steals. Trey Turner had four. So the Nats get seven steals. They rip up Arietta. Both bullpens get lit up the previous night. They're sitting at seven in the fifth. Crickets the rest of the way. Yeah, that's a pretty tough beat. That was. My God. Stealing every... Uh, now, uh, look at this. Bad beat. What is with the Yankees' bullpen? Horror show. After what happened in the West Coast trip... Then they're up 6-1 to one the other night against the White Sox. It's 6-5. to five. They blow the run line, and the game goes over. It's 3-1 to one in the eighth. All right, don't panic, but it's 3-2 in the bottom of the ninth, and then the White Sox load the bases without a hit, and Abreu wins it with a walk-off. Yeah, I mean, you know, we saw four walks in the eighth, um, and the guys who've been cleaning up for the Yanks, Batances, Clippard, you know, are both struggling uh, last night. The night before, uh, Chapman gave up a big, uh, you know, hit, uh, to allow the, that uh, fifth run to score. So it's been the elite relievers, the guy who've been getting the job done for the Yanks all season long, who've been struggling the last couple of days, hurt run line betters on Monday. And boy, that was a tough beat if you had the Yanks last night. Bad bet, 25 cent move on the Blue Jays. They had nothing. Orioles shut them down 3-1. to one. Yeah, and the, for the second straight night, Baltimore sent out a cold pitcher and the Toronto offense could not take advantage. We'll get to Wednesday's matchup between these two teams as part of Big Game Breakdown in just a moment. Bad for the books. Brewers-Reds over. Nine to ten and a half. How about that? Yeah, the books got scorched on this one, man. That's one of the bigger total moves of the season. It's one of the bigger total moves you'll ever see when you talk about a run and a half and off the key number of nine, mind you. Uh, but no mystery in how this game was going to finish once it got five to five in the bottom of the third. That's all you need to cash an over ticket. Uh, both starters, Guerrera uh, and uh, Edelman, uh, got lit up. They allowed 13 of the 14 runs between them, including seven dingers. Wind was blowing out at Great American Ballpark. This shouldn't have been a sweat. The betters had the right idea here. Yankees, White Sox, Severino, and Quintana bet from nine down to eight, and it was one to nothing uh, in the seventh inning until the fireworks happened with the bullpens. Yeah, but nonetheless, this ends up being a bad result for the books. And look, uh, with a total getting bet down and still cashing, and betters have been all over Serino uh, all season long. Severino, I should say, for all uh, all season for good reason. And again, uh, 12 strikeouts, no walks last night. Uh, and uh, Quintana, as a guy, has really started to turn his game around of late. He had a slow start, uh, but as you mentioned, one nothing into the eighth before things got a little stressful for underbetters. That being said, they still cashed, and the books still lost a bunch on the total in this ballgame. One more, Angels-Dodgers. Look at this move, the opposite of the Milwaukee game. Nine and a half down to eight at Dodger Stadium. <laughs> I mean, huge move to the under. It may be hot and humid across much of the country, but it's cool and dry in Chavez Ravine, and the ball does not carry in those conditions. Betters well aware they're not used to seeing Dodgers totals of nine and a half, and they just said, 
that's not in the right ballpark where this game should be. Not a good result for the house. Time for Big Game Breakdown, SBR Odds and Sportsbook Review. Check out the rating guide. Make sure you're betting with the trustworthy shop out there. And sponsored by and powered by Bet Online. It's more than just an online betting platform. They boast a focus on the player approach, and they've built their reputation offering clients nothing but the best from cutting-edge technology, enticing promotions, and the latest sports betting odds. Bet Online numbers, Blue Jays are $1.75, nine and a half the total. It's Miley against Stroman. Well, because the Yankees have been so bad, the door's open in the East, Teddy. No one's out of it. I mean, the Rays are right there now. Sure, but I, I mean, these are two teams, Baltimore and Toronto, that have had a chance to maybe make a move, and neither one's been able to do it. You know, they've been scuffling around. Um, there is good news for Toronto uh, when it comes to Jose Batista at the leadoff spot. I mean, he's been good. He's hit 400s and moving to leadoff with four walks, five runs scored, four ribbies, a home run, and only four a strikeouts, which has been his biggest problem all season. His quote, I'll try to do whatever it takes to help us win games. If I'm hitting leadoff, I'll try to be the best leadoff guy I can be. If I'm hitting third, I'll try to drive runs in. In whatever situation is in front of me, try to come through. I'm not really worried about personal stuff. So that's the good news for Toronto. The bad news for Toronto is that nobody else is hitting uh, on this squad right now. And it's all of a sudden, everybody's gone ice cold for the first couple of games of this series. Dylan Bundy came in. In terrible form, Kevin Gaussman came in uh, in miserable form. Both guys pitched well, well enough to shut down the Blue Jays' lineup, well enough to get wins against the suddenly slumping Toronto Bats. Strom has become one of the best ground ball guys in the game, but he keeps getting tagged when the ball's up. It's going out. Of 100 pitchers, that have thrown at least 300 innings since 2015. Look at his rate the last three seasons. He's number two in ground ball percentage. Only Keuchel is better. But he's 99th in a home run fly ball percentage at 17.6. Only Shields is worse. you got to be kidding me. Shields one of the worst pitchers in baseball. How can that happen? Yeah, I mean, some nights it feels like when Stroman throws a pitch high in the strike zone, all he can do is pray. He's been doing a lot of that uh, this season. So last week, uh, Polly, when you were doing sports with Drew, you guys were talking about how m- much the Orioles starters had fallen off under Roger McDowell. As a pitching coach, well, coach, I should say, and we got to add Wade Miley to the list of guys who have really struggled this season for Baltimore under McDowell. His career numbers, well, they're okay, but look at 2017, career worst in all the advanced metric stats, including walks per nine inning, and boy, he's been trending worse of late. First 11 starts, yeah, <laughs> the ERA wasn't great. Uh, <laughs> it was pretty good, uh, but. Certainly not what we've seen over the last four starts. He's been lit up to the tune of a 10.91 ERA. Hasn't been able to get outs in the hot summer weather in June. And, of course, until last night, and really the last two nights, the starters haven't been burning enough innings, hadn't even closed. That bullpen's been a disaster area, Polly. Man, you look at the Orioles' bullpen in June, the innings pitch, 29th, the ERA, 29th, the FIP, 30th. And the XFIP, 30th as well, unmitigated disaster for the Orioles and why they had that rough stretch. Up next, we finish out the AFC North with the Pittsburgh Steelers lined at 10.5. Man, they are loaded on offense. We'll run that down in the play of the day on SportsBit. Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com. Research before you bet. Be sure to check out SBR Picks for the best game predictions, breakdowns, and much, much more. Back on SportsBit, Betting Insight today. Time for the deep dive. The Pittsburgh Steelers. Win total 10.5, over minus 120. Last year, 11 and 5 straight up, 9, 6, and 1 ATS, 10 and 6 to the under. Mainstream stats, 23 takeaways, 18 giveaways, plus 5 turnover margin. The offense, 5.8 yards per play on offense, 4.3 yards per rush. That was average. So was 7.3 yards per pass. 21 sacks allowed, second best in the NFL. Only the Raiders had fewer. They are stacked on offense, Teddy. They certainly are. But when we look at the numbers from last year, they don't blow you away offensively. Yes, they're in the top quartile overall in yards per play on offense, but average yards per rush, average yards per pass. We remember two years ago how explosive this offense was. Last year, still a good offense, but not with that same big playability that we saw two years ago. And, of course, defensively, Last year, this team was nothing but average. What, 87.3 QB rating allowed? That was right near the league average. 
38 sacks was good. That was in the top 10, but not one of the true elite pass rushing teams. 4.3 yards per rush allowed. That was slightly below the league average. Defensively, let's call them what they were, mediocre in 2016. Draft, they take T.J. Watt out of Wisconsin in the first round. Juju Smith-Schuster out of USC. Just what they need, another wide receiver, right? As they get Bryant back off the suspension as well. And they took Connor, the running back from Pittsburgh, in the third round. Harrison led the Steelers, amazingly, with five sacks at the age of 38. He's back for another season. But they need help on that defense. So you get Bryant, Coates, Schuster to go along with Brown, and Rodgers. Roethlisberger's got all these guys to throw to. Yeah, he sure does. And let's not forget, there's Eli Rodgers, there's Justin Hunter, there's Le'Veon Bell, who's as good uh, as any pass catching back in the NFL. Uh, and I like the addition of James Conner uh, from Pittsburgh, a tough between-the-tackles runner, as well as a couple of key guys on defense. You know, we talked about Watt as the number one uh, pick. Cameron Sutton, the cornerback out of Tennessee, uh, he's got the potential to get a fair bit of playing time uh, as a rookie. And, of course, uh, let's, let's, let's not even worry too much about the defense just yet. Let's talk about this offense, an offense that didn't have all their big play weapons last year. Well, Big Ben's coming back, and basically when you're talking about big play weapons and quick strike guys, the Steelers are exceptional in that regard. And they're also exceptional when it comes to offensive line continuity, Polly. All five starting linemen have been with the Steelers for the, at least the last four seasons. And Pittsburgh, down the stretch last year, that offensive line was playing as well as any of the NFL. I ranked them as a top five offensive line going into the season. So when you have the weapons, the quarterback, and the offensive line, there's no excuse for this offense not to be scoring touchdowns in bunches and certainly not selling for field goals as they had a problem with at times last year as well. they got to stay healthy, and guys can't get suspended. Uh, certainly they are uh, scary offenses. Is this the second-best team in the AFC? On paper, you have to rank Pittsburgh as number two in the AFC because of their ability uh, to strike quickly, because of the fact they've got a Super, uh, Super Bowl-winning quarterback guy with a couple of rings uh, on his fingers in Big Ben, and because, frankly, the defense that was pretty good last year might be, you know, our defense was mediocre last year, might be pretty good this year, and that would certainly give the Steelers something of an edge over anyone else in the AFC other than New England. What do you have on the schedule? Well, I, I mean, the, the AFC North faces the NFC North and the AFC South. Their two extra games are both tough at KC at Arrowhead and then home to the Patriots. Last year, schedule slightly tougher than average. This year, pretty comparable. Right around the league average, a little bit tougher, but nothing to freak out about. Of course, it helps when you play the Browns uh, and their four-and-a-half win total twice a year. And, of course, the TV networks, they're very interested in Pittsburgh this season because six of their last seven games are either late games or prime time game. And the only exception is a 1 p.m. local start game against the Browns in Week 17, a game that Pittsburgh's hopes to be resting starters. And they have a, a four-game stretch where they play – Thursday night, Sunday night, Monday night, and Sunday night again uh, over a four-week span. So certainly the TV networks, they have a vested interest in the Steelers' success because that late season stretch comes from, what, week 11 through week 16 where it's all late night or primetime games. All right, to the class of that division, what do you want to do? Ten and a half, gun to your head. I'm not playing the Steelers over. I'm not playing the under. This, to me, is a very clear path, pass, I should say, for a team that. Uh, looks like they have a lot of talented pieces on offense on paper. I got questions about Pittsburgh. I'm not looking at them as an 11-win team, and they are a team that has nothing to prove in the regular season, but they're certainly not a team I'm looking to stand in front of. So uh, Pittsburgh, for me, a clear pass. I'm not going to get involved with this team. All right, very good. Money time, play of the day. Where are we going? Back to Toronto and Baltimore, Teddy. Take it away. Absolutely. Game number 963-964, the Blue Jays and the Orioles over 9.5. We talked about some of the struggles Toronto's offense has had in this series, but I'm telling you, when it comes to Wade Miley and that Orioles pitching staff just keeps getting worse and worse the more time they spend with Roger McDowell. Both of these teams, either or both of these teams, could approach or exceed this total all by themselves. Let's take the Blue Jays and the Orioles over 9.5 for the play of the day. All right, very good. Going to be a fun show Thursday. A lot of day games in Major League Baseball. Plus, we start with the Chicago, well, boy, the Chicago Bears. Everyone from Chicago telling me, pound the under. They don't have a chance. 
And we'll start the NFC North. We're getting close. August 3rd, Hall of Fame game football right around the corner on Sportsbit. Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com. 